Amen. Everybody said amen. amen. Now, this is either getting ready to be the biggest mess you've ever heard or God's really going to help us tonight. So if God's going to help us, I need you to help me. Is that fair enough? I've been kind of low key so far, but I'm going to kind of shift gears here a little bit tonight. And I, I may run the aisles here a little bit. You never know. You know, one of my memories of Turning Point Conference, I think the first one that I attended was uh, you guys were singing some song about fire. And man, you guys were running. I was, I was getting tired just watching you guys run. I mean, you were just, and I, I like that song. I think that ought to be requested at every Turning Point conference. Amen. If I could sing, I'd take off singing here right now. But if I started singing, you would be running the aisles. You'd be running out the back door. Amen. All right, let's go to the word of the Lord tonight. Amen. 2 Samuel chapter 21. was in the service last night and I sat in there and I, I hope it was the Holy Ghost just kind of prompted me with this and uh, I thought you know, Lord that's that's not uh, what I would want to preach at a meeting like this well you can either preach what you want or you can preach what I want you go ahead and preach and I'll show up later so I want to follow the Holy Ghost here tonight amen 2 Samuel chapter 21, verse number 15. Moreover, the Philistines had yet, had yet war again with Israel. And David went down and his servants with him and fought against the Philistines. And David waxed faint. Everybody say, David waxed faint. And Ishbabanab, which was of the <coughs> of sons of the giant, the weight of whose spear weighed 300 shekels of brass in weight. He being girded with the new sword sought to have slain David. Amen. David, Goliath's enemy. But this is a different story. It's not the one you know in 1 Samuel 17. This is a different story. I want to preach to you tonight on little ones and giants. Now just let me get into it and hopefully I can explain it to you where I come up with my title. Amen. Are you ready for victory here tonight? Yeah. Uh, just let's be honest. How many of you come in a little battle? I've been going through a little battle. Can I see your hands? All right. I hope I can preach to you tonight and help you with what you're going through. Jesus, thank you for the opportunity to be here and to stand before your people. Thank you, Lord, for your anointing. Thank you for the anointed singing, the worship, the praise. Thank you for this local church that hosts this. And I pray your blessing upon them. I ask you to help us tonight. Help us with the Holy Ghost. Help us with your anointing. Help us through your word. Let us leave here tonight with a victory that we didn't have when we came. I speak it in the name of Jesus. I declare it in the name of Jesus. Let it be so. Let it be so. In Jesus' name. Amen, amen, amen. Turn around and shake somebody's hand while you're being seated and say, it's time to slay a giant. Now, <laughs> I'm going to kill my message straight up. Trust me. Uh, well, I, I'm going to preach really good tonight. If you don't believe it, ask me. <laughs> and here's the thing. While I preach, I want God to move on you to bring a sacrificial offering to this 
altar, stage, whatever. Amen. I'd like to see us here tonight receive an offering of $25,000. There it went. It went. <laughs> Pentecostals. Pentecostals. You don't have penny here? You have penny? No? Well, in the States, we got a penny. And I've heard people say, I'm Pentecostal. <laughs> and I've also found out that God's people, I, I've met people in the church that were so stinking, stingy, and tight that they would talk through their nose to save wear and tear on their false teeth. <laughs> and when you get to talk, now he didn't put me up to this. He didn't know I was going to do this tonight. But I'd like to see not only the bills paid, which I know they'll, it's going to be taken care of, but wouldn't it be great if we left this meeting with a surplus that we could find a bigger building next year. Amen. All of our musicians and praise team and St. Louis Mafia and all that stuff. Amen. <laughs> Amen. God bless you. So I get to preach it. You know, it'd be really easy to do it if you just had 10 people here tonight that would give $2,500. Now, I've been known to take some big offerings, so don't challenge me right now. But it'd be great if we had 10 people just say, I'm going to give $2,500 tonight. Now, you don't have to stand. That's the way we normally do it. But don't let your right hand know what your left hand's doing. But I'm just asking God to speak to you. I thought y'all wanted a revival. Oh, boy, you done messed up now. I have never yet participated in a real apostolic revival that it was not marked with sacrificial giving. It doesn't exist without sacrificial giving. Boy, y'all locked up, man. I, do they normally get quiet like this when you start talking about money? Some of you are getting fidgety. You got a waller billfo, you're starting to lean on that side. <laughs> but you know what? I, I, I sat down a few weeks ago, uh, it's been longer than that, maybe two or three years ago. And I I this is what I call it, my observation of an apostolic church. Now I have preached in hundreds of churches, and I've been very fortunate to be in some revival churches that were experiencing tremendous growth and revival. And uh, one of them especially that, uh, I mean, we were seeing hundreds of people receive the baptism of the Holy Ghost. So I sat down and just began to kind of write down my observation. And I, I, I noticed things. All of them was a place of prayer. It was a place of faith, love. But it's also a place of giving. And, uh, boy, I, I told you I was going to mess my sermon up right here. I better go back to killing giants. <laughs> Which I hate to tell you, but finances is a giant. I won't say it again. Finances is a giant. And God wants to pour his blessing out on this church and all that stuff. But we got to slay a giant. Look, I've been here before. Y'all are not intimidating me. I'm not worried about your stares right now. I know I'm right. If you want out of your economy into God's, you've got to give your way into God's economy. So I'm, I'm going to stop there. I'm going to start screaming a little bit. You'll think I'm preaching. and uh, No, I'm not. Amen. And, but just let the Lord lead you, all right? Is that fair enough? Y'all people tickle me. Pentecostals tickle me. I just want God to start speaking to me and telling me to go down to the hospital and visit room 107 and walk in there and somebody's laying there about to die and I lay my hands on them and shake them real good and God raises them up. Woo, I want the Lord to speak to me.
You know what I found out about God? That's usually not where he starts. He usually starts at turning point. When a preacher starts talking about giving, <laughs> you, you, you sure you still want God to talk to you? I just want to do whatever he tells me. It doesn't start in the hospital. It starts by you sitting in a church service and you know you got $25 and you want to go to McDonald's after church. <laughs> and the Lord speaks and says, I want $20. Mm, boy. Man, I, I'm, I'm so far off right now, but I ain't got enough sense to back off of it. You know... Well, God, I don't want to give that. If I give that, I can't go to McDonald's. Well, I can tell by looking, some of you ought to give it. <laughs> that went over real well. <laughs> I had a guy that was helping me and one of the assistants, and he was in a service, and the spirit of giving came into it. And I do believe it's the spirit of giving. And uh, it came in the service, and he... Um, and he gave everything he had. And so on the way home, his wife said, we got to stop by the store and pick up a few groceries and some items. And he said, well, I'm sorry, but um, I gave most of the offer. I gave, I gave him the offering. I emptied out everything that I had. Boy, she got upset. She said, well, we need to stop. And so she said, well, I've got $7 in my purse. So I'm going to go in and I'm going to buy some milk and a loaf of bread. And so she goes in there. So she's picking out her items, and a man walks up to her and says, Ma'am, can I talk to you? Well, she panics because in the States, Walmart is known to have some character show up. <laughs> Trust me. And uh, so this man approaches her. Well, she gets nervous about it, so she's pushing her cart. And she's trying to, and he's chasing her. Ma'am, hold on just a second. Please stop. Ma'am. And I mean, she's like, oh, my God. I'm going to die right here in Walmart. <laughs> she's pushing that cart through there. And I mean, she's trying to get away from him. And they finally get up toward the front. And he said, would you just stop long enough and let me give you this? And hands her a wad of $20 bills. So I don't know why I'm doing that, but I just feel to help you with this. Now listen, I'm not going to stand up here and tell you that if you give God $10, he will automatically give you back 100 Now if that's the way it worked, you'd be a smart businessman to empty out everything you got. But I do know this, whatsoever you sow, that shall you reap. I just believe that verse. <laughs> I need to get to the giants. And uh, I had a man come to me one night after church, and he said, you preach false doctrine. I said, really? He said, yeah, you preach false doctrine tonight. I said, well, what part of it was false doctrine? He said, you said that if I give finances, God has to give it back to me, finances. I said, yes, sir. He said, that's false doctrine. I said, how is it false doctrine? Well, God doesn't have to give back to me in finances. He give back to me in health. give back to me. And I said, well, it wasn't just inclusive to finances. God can bless you in a lot of other areas. He said, well, it's just false doctrine. And I said, can I ask you a question? He said, yes, sir. I said, uh, have you ever planted a garden? He said, yes, sir. I'm a, I'm a good gardener. I thought, boy, this is working out for me. <laughs> I said, okay. I said, uh, I, don't, I don't know what kind of vegetables y'all raise here. I said, but have you ever planted tomatoes and it come up watermelons? <laughs> he said, no. Have you ever planted strawberries and it come up cucumbers? No. I said, why not? He said, well, everybody knows whatever seed you put in the ground, that's what's going to come up. I said, thank you, sir. <laughs> it is a universal law of 
harvest. Sow sparingly, you reap sparingly. You sow bountifully, you reap bountifully. See, you're the ones to determine the blessing of God in your life. Hmm. Okay. Maybe I should just turn the service over to Brother Woodward and let him finish it out right now. You know, we, we talk so much about David and Goliath. And I will tell you that David and Goliath is, is, is one of my most favorite Bible stories. I mean, I heard it when I was just a kid. And man, you get that visual of David out there, you know, with that sling. And he's got that nine and a half foot, one-eyed something across from him. And he's, uh, you know, he's going to do some damage here. But the real victory of David was not in the valley of Elah. What gave David the right to fight Goliath was not determined in the valley of Elah. It was determined in a shepherd's field. And when Saul asked him what his qualifications were to fight Goliath, he said, I kept my father's sheep. And he said, and a bear came, and I went out after him. And he said, and watch what he says, I slew him, which means he knocked him down, took the lamb out of his mouth, and then David said, and he arose to slay me. That's when I killed him. And then he says, a bear in this line, same thing. He said, I went out after him. Now, here's the thing. Uh, you know, why would you, I mean, you guys have got some, some big men around. I mean, some of you Fijian brothers, I mean, man, you guys are, I mean, you're, you know, I want you on my team, I can tell you that right now. But I don't think any of you are going to go to the, y'all have a zoo here in Sydney? I don't think any of you are going to go to the zoo tomorrow and jump over in the bear cage. <laughs> going to prove I'm a man. Or a lion. I mean, I got a friend of mine, David Shatwell. He, he just, David doesn't even know his own strength. He just, and, and I mean, I've been around him when he's done, I was like, my God, man. But, you know, it would be easy for us to say, well, he's just a little lamb. Come springtime, we'll have some more little lambs. Why would I put my life in harm's way just for a little lamb? Well, David recognized something about his enemy. And that is, if I give you a lamb today, when you're hungry, again, you're going to come back. And you're going to expect another one. And then you're going to keep coming back until I wake up one day and I don't have any of my father's sheep. Ooh, boy, I must have killed this service. Graveyard dead talking about money. Amen. <laughs> But, he, you know, that's the nature of your enemy. But David said, we're not going to do that. First of all, David recognized, these sheep don't belong to me. I'm not the one to determine whether they live or die. Mm. He'd been easy to just say, just let it go and all. But no, no, no. These sheep belong to my father. I'm not going to let the enemy come. It, we're going to just declare the war today. It may appear to be something very insignificant and trivial but yet this is the nature of my enemy. Now, don't you listen. The enemy doesn't come after Acts 2.38 in your life first. That's the valley of Elah. This is about coveting the valley of Elah. But he starts on the fringes. He starts with things that he would say to you, it's insignificant. It's not all that important. Don't fight me over that. But you've got to learn, again, the nature of your enemy. And that says, listen, I'm not just going to give you one prayer meeting because if I give you that one, you'll be back next week to get another prayer meeting. And I'm not going to give you one praise. I'm not going to give you one hallelujah because if I give you one today, it's easier to give you one tomorrow. It's not a matter of, you know, this is what, faith is like that sheepfold. It's got a lot of components to it. And so you've got to determine right now, I'm not going to give you the promise that God gave me. I'm not going to give you the prophecy that was spoken to me. I'm not going to give you the hope that I have. If I start there, where does it end? The next thing I know, I'll start questioning prophecies and the words from God, and then it just keeps on going down to where I don't even believe the Bible anymore. 
Somebody in this building tonight needs to make up your mind. It may appear to the world to be very insignificant, but I'm going to fight for it because it belongs to my father. I want to stir up some fight in some of you right now. Well, I doesn't give up, but I'm letting him have everything. Oh, no, 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 no. You need to make up your mind tonight. Greater is he that's within me than he that is in the world. I'm not giving you one thing. Ooh. Oh, boy, I could camp there. Not. So when he gets to the Valley of Elah, well, what, what's your qualifications? Well, this is my qualifications. All right, all right. Then, you know, here's my armor. You know the story. It, it, it was too big. It weighed too much. And David said, I, I can't do that. Now, watch the story. So now David steps out, and here's this nine and a half foot tall behemoth. I read this afternoon that his armor probably weighed around 120 pounds. I mean, that's bigger than some of you. I mean, the weight of that. And his spear it was somewhere like over 20 pounds. Now, you know, I know that some of you, oh, you know, 20 pounds is not that much. Well, trust me, just start going to the gym and let them give you five pounds of resistance and you're going to find out it starts adding up. And you're going to stand out there in this battle, you're going to yield this spear and the sword and this thing weighs almost 25 pounds plus this hundred and something pounds of armor. Mm. And David, there saw Goliath's out there. Send me a man to fight. You know, come on, somebody come out here and fight me. And David says, You know, there is a cause here. Is there not a cause? Oh, yeah, there's a cause. And you know the story. His brothers come to him. We know, we know your heart. Ever since that old prophet come through and poured oil on your head, you think you're better than all of us. Well, I just see that there's a cause here, and I think that somebody ought to fight him. And, and besides that, what happens to the man that kills him? Well, you get to marry the king's daughter, <laughs> which didn't turn out too good for him, by the way. <laughs> and uh, you get wealth, and your father's debt is no more taxes and all that stuff and all. But that wasn't what appealed to David. What appealed to David was is that guy's talking about my God. And so when David steps out in the field, in the valley, he, this is what he said. Everybody in Israel called him a champion. David never called him a champion. David just kept saying, who is that uncircumcised Philistine? that he would defy the armies of the living God. So David drew the line in the sand over circumcision. And circumcision in the New Testament is water baptism. That uncovenant person over there is cursing at people that are covenant people. I'm not going to stand by and let that one go. Woo. I'm not going to let it go. And so David goes out there, you know the story, he picks up five smooth stones. And, you know, I was reading some more this afternoon, and I mean, all the stuff. You know, I'm fixing to give you a little something here in a second about, you know, Goliath is supposed to have sons or brothers, and he's one. There's four more they're going to kill. So David knew and picked up five smooth stones, one for each one of the giants. I, I don't know. I've heard people say he picked up five stones because it spells J E S U S. I've heard other people say five stones is five-fold ministry. Can I tell you what I think? I think he just reached down, grabbed some rocks, stuck them in his pocket, and just had to be five. <laughs> and he goes out there, and, you know, he's, he's skillful. And, man, he lets that rock fly, and he smacks that guy. Pop, and he falls. He falls, but he's not dead. And David learned what happens when you knock your enemy down and you don't finish him off. He gets up pretty upset. 
Are you listening? Yeah. And so David never stops. From the time he let that rock go, he's running straight toward Goliath. The stone didn't kill Goliath. Goliath died by his own sword. When David got there, he picked that sword. He probably could barely pick it up. He picked that, this is going to get kind of grisly. He picked that sword up, and I mean, he whacked off the head of Goliath. And he's standing out there holding this bloody head up. And I mean, brother, they all come out. I mean, here they come. Oh, well, let's fight now. Bless God, let's fight. And David didn't stop running. David kept running until he got to what would be the city of David, Jerusalem, and he held that grisly head up to that, the gates of that city and said, now what I did to the bear, what I did to the lion, what I just did to him, I'm going to do to you next. You're going to be my capital. I'm going to take the city. Can I tell you that you can't just hit your enemy and let him get back up and say, well, you know, I knocked him down and I, you know, I just don't know why. You got to get a, some grit to you and determination. I'm going to finish this. I'm going for the victory. I'm not going to knock him down and let him get back up. I mean, I'm going to cut its head off. All right, I'm waiting on some of you to catch up right now. I'm going to cut his head off is what I'm going to do. I'm not just going to attack and punch him and then get him irritated and let him up. Let me help some of you. The worst thing you can do is engage in what you call spiritual warfare and never have the heart to say, I'm going to go all the way through with this. I need one of you big Fijian guys. Which one? You standing up. Come on. No, not you. The other guy. Woo. You're a man. I want you to know that. All right, stand up here. Stand up here. Lord have mercy. Now, what do you think is going to happen if I just walk up to him and say, pop, right in the face? I'm not going to do it. Calm down there. I mean, you know, and then after I hit him, I say, oh, man, I, I didn't mean anything by that. <laughs> Just kind of wanted to see what you'd do. Well, yeah, I mean, he's got the Holy Ghost. But I still hit him. <laughs> Boy, I, I, I'm a bad preacher and a bad person because I had a guy one night. Just stay right there. I had a guy one night, I preached, and he come up, and, and, and he, he was so upset. And, and he looked up at me, and he goes, you, you boy. Oh. So yeah, he said, you need to learn how to feed the sheep. I said, excuse me? He said, you heard me. You need to learn how to feed the sheep. Well, I got a really bad gene. It's in my DNA. So he was standing right there. I mean, he's really upset. So I leaned out over him like that, and I looked this way, and I looked that way, and I said, Sir, I don't know what you're complaining about. I don't see any sheep up here complaining. <laughs> I said, Now, I got an old goat here mad about something. <laughs> I did. And that's when he drew back to hit me. I said, Oh, no, 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 don't do that. So why? I said, because I've never been tested in this area before. <laughs> I'm telling you exactly how the conversation went. I said, I've never been tested this way before. I said, you may hit me and I may do what the Bible says. I may turn my cheek and let you hit me on the side. But I said, I don't think that's what's going to happen. <laughs> I said, you hit me, I'm going to punch you right back. <laughs> I'll, I'll turn my card in after the service. And he said, some preacher you are. And I said, well, some saint you are. You're the one come up here <laughs> disturbing my peace. So what, I mean, if I just punched this guy and then said, I was just a little upset and you made me mad and you irritated me, let's just forget it. You look like a really good guy. He's not going to just forget it. 
He's probably, I know, you got the Holy Ghost. You're sitting there saying, oh, I'd never do that. I haven't hit you yet. <laughs> I mean, if I, and then I said, ah, oh, I, I, just, I just got stirred up, and I went to turning point, and, man, they got me fired up, and I come back declaring war on my enemy. Whack. <laughs> but, you know, that's all I'm going to do. And I sure, and some of you think I'm crazy, but I want to remind you of something. Jesus said when the unclean spirit's gone out of a man, he goes through dry places seeking rest, recreation, then he comes back. The nature of your enemy is always to come back with a vengeance. You don't, what's the word I'm looking for? You don't. How can I say this? It'd be like me taking that uh, bottle of water over there, displaced, and sticking my finger in it and all this water flowing out. Well, I displaced it. Well, the alternative to what I have displaced can only turn on what displaced it. And so when you start moving into spiritual territory, you better make up your mind. I'm not just going to go a little ways in this and stop. I'm going to go until there is an ultimate victory I'm going to go until I slay this thing. I'm going to go until I have dominion. Somebody clap your hands to the Lord here a second. Now, let me, let me move on. Man, I forgot to set my timer again tonight. Seriously. Now, here's David, man, I mean. All this great victory. And boy, we preach David and that slingshot. All this stuff and all. Well, that's 1 Samuel. Now when you get to 2 Samuel, it's a different story. <clears throat> David is not the young man he was in 1 Samuel 17. And he goes to battle again. The Philistines. Everybody say Philistines. Oh, Sister Chanel told me something one time. She said, you know why that they can never get a victory against the Philistines? I said, no, why? She said, because I think that the Philistines is a type of the flesh. It just always keeps coming back. you got a war against it constantly. So, you know, maybe that works for you. I don't know. And so the deal is they're going to, they're going to battle again. And there's this other giant down there by the name of Ishbabanon. And... Uh, so David, you know, the great giant slayer, gets out there, and I mean, he's fighting this giant, and he starts waxing faint. And this giant said, I'm going to kill him. I'm going to kill this king. I'm going to kill him. That's the text. I'm going to finish him off. And can I tell you that if it hadn't been for a guy by the name of Abishai, who come and secured David. We don't know what the end of that story would have looked like if he hadn't come and said, I'll take it from here. I'm here to help you. I'm not going to let that giant kill you. After they got through with that battle, the men of Israel came to David and said, no more battles for you. You stay, stay out of this. No more battles for you. Lest the light of Israel go out we don't need you fighting the battles for us we need you to train us how to fight the battles you're the original giant slayer you got quite a testimony now I want you to listen I, I, especially the next generation you see David could not fight the next generation's giant they had to fight it. I cannot fight this generation's giant. You have to face this generation's giant. And you have to slay this. Are you listening to me? Now don't, don't, don't take this wrong. Don't take this wrong. I, a matter of fact, I, Sister Morgan, I've been talking about this. and I've been telling the church. I said, I fought my giant. I said, I think I got victory. I said, but I'm getting too old now to fight your giants for you. I found out about Pentecostal people. They'll let, they'll let you fight all the battles for them. They'll just sit there and watch you. 
Bless him, Lord. Bless him, Lord. I don't have the energy to fight your giants. Goliath had a completely different spear. It was made out of iron. Ishbabanab had a, had a brass spear. Completely different materials. So the things that I faced in my generation and the iron spears have changed with your generation. It's a different weapon. It's a different method. I hope it's starting to make sense. I cannot fight your giant for you. These elders that are here, we can't fight. I was preaching one time revival. This is years ago. And, and God, he's, he really does. He speaks to me a lot in dreams. Just, that's just the way it's been. And so I dreamed in this church that I was preaching that I was in the congregation and there was some elders and some older people in there. And they had this, they had this old snake skin. You ever seen a snake shed its skin? And they were holding it up and they were saying, we killed our serpent. We killed our serpent. And when I walked out the door, there was a young, I would call it a tender tree. And in that tree was wrapped this little serpent, this little snake, which I knew that represented the next generation. My generation saying, we, we, we fought, we won. But the next generation's got its own serpent that you got to fight. What we need is not to fight it for you. We need to raise up a generation of giant slayers that know how to get in the trenches and know how to take care of the giant. Oh, praise God. I hope this is all right. I don't plan on, I'll help you. I'm not out yet. I just, you know, all right, God. Now, let me, let me hurry through this. You know, they get to Kadesh Barnea, and, uh, man, it's just, you know, they spies go over there, they come back, and, oh, yeah, it's everything you said, Moses, but it's got walled cities. Oh, yeah, here's milk and honey that we brought back from it. But it's also got giants. And in our sight, we were like grasshoppers. Boy, what a way to look at yourself. Grasshoppers, insignificant. And so are we in the sight of our enemy. Can I tell you that however you see yourself, it's how your enemy is going to see you? We are not able to take the land. Now watch what they said. We can't do it lest our little ones fall prey to those giants. Ooh. And brother, I don't know if this is a good word here or not, but they ticked God off. It's called the day of provocation. They upset God. He said, what do you mean? that they'll fall prey there. He said, you're the generation that I brought out of Egypt. I have fed you. I have clothed you. I brought a cloud to protect you. And you're telling me that they're going to fall prey to those giants over there? First of all, is that your promised land or not? See, all of us look at the promises of God and we think, well, the promised land ought to be free of giants. They're not, it's not free of giants. It never will be free of giants. If you're going to get your promise, you're going to have to fight a giant to get to it. If you're going to get what God told you, you're going to have to bow up and go after it and say, you know what, I'm not letting you stop me from putting my feet in the promises of God that God has decreed and declared to me. Hallelujah. Not going to do it. Not going to do it. Now watch what happens. God said, okay, all right, I'll take care of this problem. He said, you're going to wander in the wilderness for 40 years. This generation is going to die in the wilderness. You provoke me. After everything I did for you, you didn't think that I could take care of the next generation. Oh, I could take care of you, but I can't take care of them. I'm telling you, that's what was going on in the story. It's exactly what was going on. And so for 40 years, and watch what, what happens. And they said, we're not able to go up and take it. And then when God said, you're right, you're not going in. Watch what happens. They, they changed their mind. Oh, yeah, let's, let's go in. 
After God said, you're not going in, they said, oh, yeah, let's go in. That didn't end well for them. And so finally they wandered in the wilderness for 40 years. Now, can I tell you, listen, listen. I pastor, well, I don't know that I pastor, but <laughs> I'm over a church in the great state of California. And, man, somebody said, how did you get there? God. I have a dream. In the dream, I'm dusting my hands, and I said, okay, God, where do I go from here? And in the dream, the Lord said, look to the San Bruno Mountain. And when I looked, there's a mountain that appeared to my right. When I looked on the top of it, it's like a telescopic lens focused up there, and I could see a man standing there, and he yells out, San Francisco. So the next morning, Sister Morgan and I are having breakfast, and I said, you're not going to believe what I'm about to tell you. Now understand, I am pastoring, you won't even know how to pronounce it, Oak Mulgee, Oklahoma. Population 17,800 people, 25 miles south of Tulsa, Oklahoma. You cannot get two totally different cultures than Oak Mulgee, Oklahoma and San Francisco, California. I said, uh, we may end up in San Francisco. She said, well, if that's where God wants us, that's the way she's always been. If that's where God wants us, then it'll work out. Well, you know, I just thought, well, maybe, maybe I just ate something before I went to bed and dreamed this crazy dream, you know. <laughs> and so I thought, I'm going to look it up. If there's a San Bruno Mountain, I'll know that this is from God. So I went to looking it up. This is even before computers. <laughs> Took me a while. <laughs> we have a house that sits on the side of the San Bruno Mountain that overlooks the entire Bay Area. So I'm like, okay, all right, all right, all right. Uh, I, I'm, you know, all right. Well, now I'm starting to start checking on how much it costs to live in San Francisco. Ooh. Now, I know you're in Sydney, and it costs a lot here, too. But just listen. It was the second most expensive city in America to live. And I was like, man, Manhattan was number one then. We were number two, and we, we passed Manhattan. And I was like, oh, my Lord, look how much money it's going to cost me to go there. And then I had two teenage daughters and a four-year-old boy that I started getting concerned. I'm going to move my family into Sodom and Gomorrah. <laughs> so that's what I felt. This is crazy. This is ridiculous. They didn't end well for a lot. <laughs> Why in the world? So I got two or three confirmations, but I still kept pushing off. So I finally, I, I refer to this a lot. So I finally called back the old prophet, Sister Chanel, Marilyn Chanel, and I said, Sister Chanel, I need to talk to you about something. She, she had no way of knowing about it. She said, oh, do you want to talk to me about San Francisco? I said, how did you know? The Holy Ghost spoke it to me. I said, well, great. I was hoping you'd tell me I lost my ever-loving mind. She said, what's the problem? I said, well, number one is I'm worried about my children. See, I didn't know it, Brother Woodward, but I was doing the same thing right then to God that they had done to God in Kadesh Barnea. It's like God said, so you don't think your kids can survive in that culture? I didn't know it. I, I was doing the same thing that they were doing. And Sister Chanel, she said, uh, yeah, the Lord said go. He'll protect your children. And he has. We've been there over 20 years, and he has. He's protected my children. They live for God. It's, it's his goodness. It's his goodness. And so he protected them. She said, is there something else? I said, yeah. I said, the cost of living. I said, Sister Chanel, it costs a lot of money to live in San Francisco. She starts laughing at me. <laughs> Something funny? <laughs> yeah. What's funny? You. I said, how am I funny? <laughs> You're just funny. <clears throat> I'm starting to kind of get irritated. 
And I said, well, pray tell me how I'm funny. She said, well, when you said that, I seen the Lord break out in a sweat trying to figure out how he's going to provide for you. She said, now, where you live, it may take you $3. Where you're going, it may take you $3 million. She said, and I know it's harder for God to come up with the $3 million. He can come up with $3, but he's going to have a hard time coming up with $3 million, right? <laughs> and I can tell you right now, I, we went to San Francisco we, we, did, we didn't get any finances to go. We just went the way that we felt like. And I'm not opposed to that. I think it's a great deal. And, and since we have been there, God has always, always provided. I said he's always provided. I prophesied to a man in 1989. We went to California in 1998. I prophesied to a man in 1989 in Austin, Texas. He was in the front. I said, sir, I said, I just feel to tell you something. He said, what's that? I said, God's going to bless you abundantly. And I said, I don't mean, I mean, he's really going to bless you. And he said, okay. And I said, to the degree that you're going to have to have people around you to protect you because of the blessing of God. And he said, Okay. So he come up after church and he said, I believe everything you said, but he said, I want you to know that I filed bankruptcy. He got in a business deal with a guy in the church and this guy ripped him off. And he said, they picked up equipment out of my yard. He said, I don't have anything. And he said, but I can promise you this, if God does what you said, you will never have to worry about how you're going to fulfill your ministry. 1989, 1998, we move. 2004, the beginning of 2005. It's okay if I just share this with everybody. We, we went out there, and I, you know, we went to do the deal in San Francisco, and I was just traveling. I mean, I just was busy traveling, and I mean, everybody, oh, you're an evangelist, you need to travel. And so I, I went to General Conference. I went to General Conference and uh, Salt Lake City, and they asked me to speak at the Chinese Evangelism Seminar. Brother Willoughby was the one that was hosting this. And so I, I went, I, I, but the night before, Sister Morgan and I were sitting in our room, and I said, I just need an answer about San Francisco. If I could just get an answer, what do I do with it? I mean, you know, I'm just not sure. So the next day in the Chinese evangelism deal, they had me and Brother Stone King speak. Well, Brother Stone King went first. <laughs> which means there's no second. <laughs> and so Brother Willoughby come over to me and he said, hey, listen, we got a lot of time left. And I want you to know that you still need to get up and speak. God's giving you a word for us. I said, Brother Willoughby, seriously, this thing's blown open. Let's just kind of fan the flames and let it go. And he said, no, 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 you got something to say. He turned to walk off, and when he did, he whirls back around and grabs me by my shoulders, and he shakes me. I'll tell you why I sent you to that city. On one hand, I'll give you America. It's a gateway city. On one hand, I'll give you, and I hope you don't take offense by this. On one hand, I'll give you America. On the other, I'll give you Asia. You are not to question me about that city again. <laughs> I got that one. This is my promised land. Now, we got some giants. California has some giants. I mean, we've blessed the world with a lot of good stuff. <laughs> it's crazy. And I was starting to do what they were doing there. All I could see was the giants and the next generation. That's all I could see. My God, man, we got this crazy stuff that's going on. I mean, we got, I mean, it's just a wicked place. And finally God had to kind of, you know, and say, okay, look, 
Yes, it's a land filled with giants, but this is your promised land. Now, what are you going to do about it? Well, we're going to possess our promised land. Then get ready to fight some giants. Your kids are going to fight some giants. This next generation is going to fight some giants. But don't tell me that I cannot give the next generation victory over that culture. I'm going to raise up apostolic young men and women that are going to walk in victory and walk in power. Are you listening to me? They're going to do something for the kingdom of God. Let them do it. Help them. Train them. Guide them. Point them in the right direction. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Tap your hands to the Lord here a second. That's why I'm telling you, young men and women here tonight, don't just knock him down. Don't come to Turning Point and get all fired up and bless God up here on the altar and then plan on going home and never changing and just letting it up and letting it go. No, no, that's the worst thing you can do. If you made a vow to God up here that you're going to get victory, you go back to wherever you're from and you roll your sleeves up, you pull the sword of the Spirit, you get right in the middle of the battle and let the devil know just like David did. You come with a sword and a spear, but I'm coming in the name of the Lord. I am a covenant, one God, apostolic person. You cannot stand against me. Somebody ought to praise him right now. I'm about done. They're just giants, man. There's just giants. I mean, giants of technology. Giants of people can't figure out what they are. I would have never thought in my lifetime that we'd be facing some of the social issues that we're facing right now. I mean, it just kept coming. And here we are. People don't know what they are. I, I told somebody the other day, I said, you know, we got all these letters that stand for something. I said, before long, if we don't stop, we'll have the whole alphabet. <laughs> See, that's what you are going to face. I can stand over and say, no, the world's just crazy. It's flipped out. That's all I can tell you. But this generation's got to deal with it. This generation's got to fight it. And what I want to tell this generation tonight is, hey, God didn't plan on you getting here and then you dying by the hand of a giant. Turning point was intended to do something. It was intended to stir up some fight, let you know that God is with you. And if God is for you, who in the world can be against you? That ought to be your slogan. That ought to be your motto. If God be for me, who can be against me? What thing can be against me? What circumstance can be against me? I am a covenant person. God is bound to keep me. Let me tell you, I'm going to try to wrap it up with this. I, I, I went to Oklahoma. I'd come off the evangelistic field. I, I had been preaching in New Brunswick. Matter of fact, Brother Wilbur to get a kick out of this. I preached, this is 1988, I preached the Atlantic District's Youth Convention. And the district superintendent was determined that I was going to take a church in New Brunswick. And there was a church there that came open, Hatfield Point. And he said, I want you to take that church. What? Because I'd already been invited to come preach in Oklahoma. And I'd already felt like God had spoke to me about that. And I said, Brother Beasley, I just don't, you know, I, you know, promise me that if you don't get that church, at least consider Hatfield Point. I said, I'll do that. So I get voted in in Oklahoma. I'm off the evangelistic field. You know, evangelists, they just love them and leave them. Yeah. And, you know, I mean, just preach revival, preach faith, and just, you know. Now I'm pastor. 
And I thought just going in there preaching the same stuff, preach revival, preach faith, preach the Holy Ghost. They'll just flood through the doors. <clears throat> no one told me about family owned and operated churches. They didn't tell me about, and hopefully this doesn't offend you, board run churches. When I took the Oak Mogi Church, I had two church boards. They were fighting, and I had two brothers. One was on the church board, and the other on the board of trustees. And they would almost get in fist fights over who was going. Can we buy toilet paper? Let's take a vote. I mean, it was ridiculous. It's just crazy stuff. And I mean, so I, that's, our first Sunday there, we had 40-something people. I'd only been there a few weeks, and one of the main guys come to me and said, we're going to starve you out. Well, have fun with that one. <laughs> I'm going to be here a while, trust me. <laughs> and I mean, it was just one situation after another. I mean, listen, I'd been off preaching somewhere, come home, and, and it was my first year anniversary. I made it a year. <laughs> I had a lady tell me, if you make it a year here, I'll give you $1,000. She still owes me that $1,000. <laughs> and so I, I had Brother Urshan coming in to preach our one-year anniversary. <laughs> I had survived. When I get home, they're having music practice, and they call me from there. I mean, I had just put my suitcases down, and they call and said, Brother Morgan, you better get down here to church. What's going on? Oh, they're out in the church parking lot fist fighting. I said, what? Yeah, they're out there fist fighting. I said, what in the world's going on? Well, you know, this young couple, they're getting a divorce, and she's over the music, and he showed up and said he wanted to talk to her, and she said no, so he just drug her out through the center aisle with, I mean, literally grabbed her by the hair of the head and drug her out the center aisle. And then he gets outside there, and one of the ladies in the church said, you need to stop. He said, you better shut your mouth, lady. When I get done with her, I'll start on you. Well, he didn't know that that other woman's husband was around the corner. And brother, it was on. <laughs> Let me give you some good advice. <laughs> Don't ever threaten another man's wife. <laughs> I mean, I pulled up and they were going at it. It, it. it was just crazy. Crazy. I cannot tell you the mental stuff that we went through the witchcraft that we fought, the medicine that was practiced against us. They would put blood on the wall, on the sides of the church. They'd cut up cows and plant cow parts. It was just crazy. I had medicine men come to church and they were you know, putting spells on me and the whole deal. <laughs> Seriously. I mean, I just barely got there. <laughs> I should have resigned. I promise you, and you can ask her, I, I got a Ph.D. in pastoring that church. <laughs> I, I need to write a book. People wouldn't believe it. It was just one thing after another. And I got to thinking, boy, I'm the most dysfunctional pastor <laughs> in the world. Ooh. Mm. So I'm, I'm, I don't have enough sense to leave. I'm just slugging it out, praying, seeking God, preaching, praying, seeking God. I mean, that, that's, that's all I knew to do. And so we had an evangelist come. I'm about done. We had an evangelist come preach for us. And uh, this guy was kind of known as a, like a gunslinger. Y'all have gunslingers here? Oh, boy. Yeah. Crocodile Dundee? Yeah. yeah, there you go. Uh, now you know what I'm talking about. Mm -hmm. I mean, they used to hire gunslingers. These old cowboys come into town when the bad guys had it, and boy, they'd just shoot everybody and ride out. 
But that's kind of his reputation. He'd come in and kind of deal with stuff and all. So I had him preaching for me. This guy was tough. And I knew that he had this practice to where if the service locked up, he just quit preaching. And he'd say, now we're not going any further till we have a breakthrough here tonight. <laughs> so he's preached along that night. And he just stopped. He said, I'm not, I'm not going any further until we get a breakthrough here tonight. And he just starts staring at him. <laughs> well, I knew those people. I knew how stubborn they were. <laughs> and I figured out real quick, we are in for the longest church service <laughs> in the history of the church. We just couldn't seem to get a break. And this is, it was just constant resistance. Just You just kind of move a little bit and then you just get knocked back the other way. This was my giant. So he's doing that. and Well, I just decided, you know what? Fooey on all of them. I could care less about him and I could care less about them right now. I'm going to worship God. So I just stood up on the platform. I stood up. I just started, I love you, Jesus. I worship you, Lord. And the next thing I knew, you ever been in a service where it felt like the winds of God was blowing in it and you just felt that? Well, that's what I started feeling. Ooh. And I mean, brother, it's, <laughs> it started feeling pretty good. I mean, I was totally up from these others. They're, they're, they're not even there as far as I'm concerned. And I mean, it just kept coming, and it kept coming, and it kept coming. And the next thing I do, now I know, now I'm, I'll get into this right here. I know that you want to hide your spiritual family tree. I'll explain it. Next thing I know, I'm getting intoxicated in the Holy Ghost. See, I'm preaching to social drinkers here tonight. People that like to sip. Ooh. I failed Jesus. I'm not talking about social, spiritual, social drinking. I'm talking about, I don't know the word to use here, guzzlers. I mean, they just turn it up and chug it. I mean, I'm just really getting lost in this. Now, I'll tell you something about getting drunk. I've never been drunk, but this is what I've been told. I had some uncles that were alcoholics. I went with my dad one time to a tavern to get one of my uncles out. When he brought him out, he was bloody. He had been in a fight. And you know what the fight started over? He was in there and started getting drunk and decided he wanted to preach. <laughs> we don't come to the bar in the tavern to hear preaching. He said, blankety, 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 you're going to listen to my preaching. Well, it ends up in a fight. My dad had to go in there and drag him out. Now, listen. If you got enough alcohol running through your bloodstream, I could hit you with a two before, open your head up, and you'd never feel a thing. You'd just be like, <laughs> I mean, blood's running. You're like, boy, if I ever wake up and figure out you hit me, I'm going to be mad. <laughs> I mean, you're just, because you got so much alcohol, you don't feel that. Our problem is, we're trying to fight the giants sober. You're trying to fight him out of your mind. You're trying to fight him out of your strength, out of your intellect. Have fun with that one. He's going to wear you down and kill you is what's going to happen. Woo. So my advice to you is just get drunk. Stay drunk. You're really going to have to, you'll have to fix this one. That preacher from America told us it's okay for us to get drunk. Well, wait till I give you my next little insight. The drunker you get, 
the better everybody looks. I mean, she could be tore up from the floor up. And you're like, hey, baby, you're beautiful. <laughs> I'm laughing at my own thing here. <laughs> Listen, when you come to church sober, you see all the ugly you see all the mistakes. You see all the problems. And that's all you can focus on. But brother, when you get, I think the scripture says, don't be drunk in wine where is excess, but rather be ye filled with the Spirit. So I'm still in the book. And when you start drinking and you move away from that in spiritual intoxication, you'll start seeing everything in the church, everything in the district, everything around about you. You'll start critiquing, you'll start criticizing, but my advice again is just get inebriated on the Holy Ghost wine, and the next thing you know, hey, everybody's good. Everything's great. I'm, I'm trying to tell you how I've dealt my giant. I just got drunk. And I mean, I'm into this. Just, And then it's like I noticed that I was speaking in tongues, but it wasn't what I call the dainty tongue of edification. This was like, oh. It was forceful. It was authoritative. It's coming deep. And I noticed that when I was saying that, that in tongues, I could hear this in my spirit. Who art thou, O spirit, that you would exalt yourself against the living God? I knew that I had squared off of whatever it was that had bound that church, that had bound that city, and it was a spirit that had exalted itself just like Goliath. Send me a man to fight. Well, I showed up, didn't have enough sense not to, but I showed up and I recognized that there was a cause. And those arrogant spirits, makitara moshatu makata. Them arrogant spirits that exalt themselves against God. Every high thing that exalted itself against God. It raises up and tries to intimidate you and tell you that you'll never get it. You'll never have the break. You'll never get there. You'll never see it happen. I'm telling you that's a lie that come out of the pit of hell. I want to say it again. Greater. Greater. Greater is he that's within you than he that is in the world. Pick up your sword and go to battle. Let me tell you what happened. I mean, I'm just... And I knew that I was falling to my knees. And I knew when I fell, we're getting the victory over this thing. This is it. Now, I didn't know about this part, but the people that were there said, when you hit your knees, it looked like something picked you up and threw you across that platform. So I start here when I come to them on the other side. When I raise up off the floor and I open my eyes, Everybody in that building except one person was either in the floor, draped across the pew, slain in the spirit. Every one of them except one person. She was a visitor. She had never been in a Pentecost church in her life. When they brought her in that night, they brought her in a wheelchair, crippled in a wheelchair, been there all of her life. And when I looked up, 
there was only one person standing. And it was her. And she's coming down the center aisle. It's tears. Look, I'm walking, I'm walking, I'm walking. Let me tell you something. Quit running from your giant. I said, quit running from your giant. Quit letting him intimidate you. Quit looking at society and issues and saying, I don't know how we're going to win. God never put us here to let us be defeated or to be overcome by these issues that we're facing. Raise up in the Holy Ghost. Declare war in the Spirit. You're not going to do it. I rebuke you in the name of the Lord. I'm coming to you in the name of the Lord. A name that is higher than all names. Woo! Woo! Just, I'm, I'm done. I'm done. I'm done. Pick up the sword and use it. Can I teach you one thing here just in closing? I really am. The Bible says it's the sword of the Spirit, which is the Word of God. But I want you to listen. Every kingdom has a sword. Every kingdom has a sword. Faith cometh by hearing and hearing by the Word of God. So God has words, but so does your enemy. Faith cometh by hearing, hearing by the Word of God. Fear comes by hearing and hearing by the Word of your enemy. So this is a battle of words. This is skillful swordsmen. Because the enemy comes in trying to convince you of his words. My wife talked to me the other day about a false narrative. He comes in convincing you by his words, which speaks into your mind. To get real victory over a spirit doesn't mean you go down and fast 40 days in the church until God speaks to you and says, that devil's name is Bob, deal with him. What that means is that spirits control thinking. Every nation that's represented in here, there is a spirit that controls the thinking of your nation. Every community, every city, every ethnicity, it controls thinking. It creates culture. Woo. That's how it works. So where does he attack you? Where does the John attack you? Anybody relate to what I'm talking about right now? Right there. Who are you? Who are you? You little runt, who are you? This is what you choose God to fight me with? This one? Mm-hmm. You go ahead and pull your sword because I'm going to give them the sword of the Spirit and they're going to learn how to war against you with my word. Listen, not with your emotions. That's where Pentecostals mess up. Ooh, I feel God. I feel victory. Listen to me. Your emotions will lie to you. You got to learn how to let the word work. The word works regardless of how you feel. And you got to learn how to pick the sword up. And when the enemy is bombarding your minds with all the what if, what if, what if, this is what I'm going to do. You got to learn how to take the word of God and combat against it and say, hey, I got one for you. If God is for me, then who can be against me? Now, you just run along. You just run along. You're trying to convince me that my God has forsaken me. But his word says, I am with you always, even to the end of the world. I'm with you on the mountaintop. I'm with you in the valley. I'm with you always. I'll never leave thee nor forsake thee. Now, enemy, back off right now because I'm telling you what the word of God says. I don't have to feel victory, but I can declare victory. I don't have to feel overcoming, but I can overcome by the word of my testimony. I'm going to speak it. 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 I'm going to keep saying it until it becomes a reality. And I got the grizzly head of that giant in my hand saying, look what the Lord has done. Somebody shout unto the Lord right now. Open your mouth and shout unto God right now. Oh, don't stop. Keep on, keep on, keep on. Open your mouth and declare war by your words here tonight.
on this Saturday night, I feel a, a mandate from God. I want you to stir up the giant slayers. I want you to let them know that I've been with this past generation. I'll be with them. Stir them up. Stir them up. I'm trying to stir you to the good war. I want you to listen just a second. Your biggest enemy is going to be fear. It's going to be fear. Well, what if God's not with you? What if you do this and you fail? What if, what if, what if, what if, what if? Make sense? You got to learn, you know what? I, I'm just, I'm not, I'm not going there. I'm not going to let you take over my mind. I'm not going to do it. I'm not going to do it. I'm going to war against you. I'm going to fight against you. I'm not going to do it. I'm not going to do it. He wants to use the weapons. He wants to defeat you. You need to wake up and realize that. And I'm, I'm, I'm going to say this, and maybe I shouldn't. But don't be surprised who becomes his mouthpiece. Some of your family will tell you, you can't live like that. You can't do that. You can't see that happen. Now, don't you listen? Timothy is struggling with fear. Read it. From the first epistle to the second epistle, something had happened to Timothy. He had become intimidated. Personally, I think he got to look around Ephesus, seen everything he's going to have to deal with, and he started getting intimidated. That's why Paul says to him in the second letter, God's not given you a spirit of fear, but of love, power, and a sound mind. But read what else he says to Timothy. He said, now, Timothy, concerning the prophecies that went before on you, that thou by them mightest war a good warfare. See, you got to learn how to war for your prophecy. You've got to learn how to tell the enemy, I'm not giving you my promise. I'm not giving you what God spoke to me. I don't care how bad it looks. I don't care how much it seems like it's going backwards. I am going to war for my prophecy. What all has God spoke to this area about what he's going to do? And the enemy wants to intimidate you and get you to back off. But tonight in the Holy Ghost, somebody needs to start warring for your prophecy right now. I mean, if it was me, I'd just go to talking in tongues and magnifying God and praying in the Holy Ghost or lifting my voice. I'd be doing something right now, letting the enemy know, I'm not giving you this prophecy. I'm going to war against you right now in the Holy Ghost. Woo! I can't war for your prophecy. You got to war for it. It ought to be something so precious to you. I don't care how long it's been since he promised you. You got a war for it. You got a war for it. Woo! I'll tell you what I think would be a good way for us to close this. You ready? Let the high praises of God be in their mouth and a two-edged sword in their hand to execute vengeance upon the heathens and punish them. Woo. High praise. High praise. High praise. I mean, you ought to give God high praise and the enemy ought to be shaking right now. Oh, no, here they go. Oh, no, here they go. If they give God high praise and they start warring against me, I have to back up. I have to let go. I have to really, come on, lift your voice now. Don't give him a low praise. Give him a high praise. And while you're praising him, pick up the sword and start cutting through stuff right now. I, I, I know, I know, I know it's crowded. I, I understand it's crowded. and I ain't got a lot of room up here. Now, now hang on a second. Now hang on a second. I thought we'd come to an agreement that while I was preaching, you'd obey the Holy Ghost and bring your offering. Now, I don't need discernment. I can just look around. 
Oh, there it went again. <sighs> we went from high praise to, oh boy. Don't leave this service without doing what the Holy Ghost told you to do. That's all I'm going to tell you. Don't leave this service without doing what the Holy Ghost told you to do. Now, don't shout over your disobedience. Your reasoning. Don't do it. But here's what I think we ought to do. I think that we ought to just celebrate together. I mean... Let me, let me go back to the first turning point I was here. Man, they were singing that song, running, and I mean, place just like, Poof. well, I know you're in a fancy ballroom. I know you don't have a lot of room. I, I get that. But man, we ought to celebrate our victory. I mean, we, we ought to magnify God with our victory. We ought to sound off tonight in everything in this region senses it and knows it. But, you know, okay, okay, okay. All right, all right, all right. This is a little inspiration here. Did you know that in the book of Psalms, there's, I studied this out and I, I need to find it again. I got notes somewhere. But in the book of Psalms, it talks about there is a praise that God's people gives that literally activates angels. It activates the heavenly host. And in that text, what it says is, is before God ever created or God ever allowed Sydney, Australia to be on the map, he from creation put angels in this geographical area and said, there'll be a day that my people's going to come and they're going to magnify me and they're going to worship me. And when they do, I'm going to release this angelic host. Did you know that when Jacob's running in fear of his life and Esau's about to kill him, I wish I could pronounce the name. I think it's Mahanaim or something like that. It means double camp. In other words, Jacob's got his camp running in the fear of his life, but then God sent a host of angels. Read the story, a host of angels, and God wanted them to know, you're not by yourself. I sent another camp to walk with you here. It's called the double camp. And I'm convinced that if we would really just do what God tells us to do in obedience to offering and praise and worship to God, I just believe that when we leave here, we will have activated something in the Holy Ghost. Would you like for that to happen? Would you like to go home with the other camp walking with you saying, you're not by yourself. I'm here to war for you. I appreciate all of your faithfulness and your obedience here tonight. Woo. Are we ready? Are, are we ready? You ready to activate something in the Holy Ghost? I mean, if it was, I'd just lift my voice unto the Lord. I would declare the goodness of God. I mean, that, that's what I want you to do right now. I mean, just praise. They can give their offering while you praise. I mean, just lift your voice and give God praise. I mean, fervent Holy Ghost praise tonight and see what God's going to do. somebody by the hand do it a lot but it works get somebody by the hand if you can get out in the aisle get out in the aisle you can get a little more space do that we're going to go to God with united praise and when we do something's going to shift in the Holy Ghost Something's going to shift in the spirit world. Something's going to be activated. And I'm telling you in the Holy Ghost that before some of you get home, it would have already beat you there and God's already working in this situation. Now get somebody by the hand and I want you to start giving God high praise. I want you to fervently give God praise. I want you to lift your voice and shout unto the Lord. I want you and that brother or sister that you're joining together. I mean, lift the roof off this place tonight. 